So hello and welcome joining into our call. Now, as usual, we're just going to give it a few moments as everyone joins the session. Um, but welcome back. I hope everyone's had a good week. Now, just to remind you, if you do have any questions throughout today's session, do please make sure to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You can click on that and type in any questions for either myself or our guests today. Also, do make sure to take advantage of the chat box to help sort of offer the commentary throughout today's session. If you have anything you want to sort of discuss either with us or with your fellow attendees. Now I see everyone's joining, so I think we'll get started. So hello and welcome back to iSpy360's webinar series. I'm your host, Frederick, and I'm overjoyed to have you back for today's Future Friday session, which is on the future of prop tech and how to invest in the future. Now I'm overjoyed to be joined with Alec Page today who is a vice president at Rec Ventures, an early stage venture capital fund that is based in Park City, Utah. They're focused on real estate technology and backed by over 2 million units worth of rental real estate owners and operators. Now, Alec joined Rec Ventures in 2017 from the leveraged finance group at B of A Merrill Lynch in New York, where he works on debt capital financings for corporate issuers and private equity funds. He holds a BA in economics from the University of Chicago. Now at RET, Alec leads investment diligence, supports portfolio company growth strategy, and develops investment and incubation theses across IoT, AI, leasing, and marketing SAAS, energy, utility optimization, and last but not least, FinTech. Now this is of course among other verticals. So he's really knowledgeable about everything we've been talking about in this series, and we're overjoyed to have him with us. Alec, thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Good to, good to be here. So the first thing I wanted to ask you was, how did you get started in the venture capital game? Yeah, um, so, so there are, I think, a lot of paths that people take uh, into VC. Uh, for me, it was kind of through a more traditional finance background. Um, I, I grew up in the Bay Area in San Francisco in and around uh, technology and, and tech companies, various internships at startups, um, and always wanted to, to be in kind of the technology industry. Uh, in school, I studied economics uh, and ended up going to investment banking after college uh, and uh, focused on um, kind of developing that uh, financial markets and modeling and analysis skill set uh, with an eye towards taking that back to the technology industry. Uh, and that's when uh, our founding partner, John Helm, was starting RET Ventures um, and uh, needed somebody to come in and, and, and help get the, the fund going. Uh, and so that was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And it seemed like a, a great place to, to land uh, and start you know, building the skill set to, to transform companies and, and grow companies and, and ideally, hopefully, transform an industry or multiple industries through some of our investments. Excellent. So what was it that drew you to the industry or sector, really, of investment? Um, so investment broadly, um, I, I think it, it, you know, in venture capital investment specifically, um, it comes down to the type of relationships that we have with companies. Uh, it, it's not a passive investment um, business, right? It, it's not, you know, coming up with a, a thesis, having conviction behind that thesis and making a bet. Uh, it certainly is that. But uh, that's where our relationship with a company starts, right? So the reason why I think venture capital investing is so fascinating is we develop those theses, we talk to founders, we think that it's worth making a bet, but then we start working with the company and helping them grow. So there's an element of strategy post-investing uh, that I think is fascinating. Uh, and if we can help uh, a founder or, or a founding team grow their company um, and be successful through our network, through our uh, expertise, et cetera, um, then, then that's, uh, that's how we're successful. So I, I love that kind of dual uh, investment conviction and also then strategy and, and, and helping grow companies. Uh, I, I think that's fascinating. Excellent. Now, how is RET different from other venture capital firms? Yeah, so, so we have a, a really specific strategic focus, right? We're focused exclusively on real estate tech. And even within that, we have a, a focus on the residential market. So, so what we call rent tech, uh, multifamily rental, single family rental, um, that's our primary focus. Uh, so that alone, I think, you know, it's not unique, but it's rare. Um, and, and so we're very specifically focused. What does make us unique 
um, is the, the value add that we have for companies. So, so like you mentioned in, in your intro, um, we're backed by uh, strategic investors only. So all of our investors, and we're a traditional venture fund structure, we have limited partners uh, who invest in our fund, um, but all of those limited partners, they're not traditional institutional endowments, pension funds, uh, they're real estate owners and operators. So what makes us unique is all of the capital we have comes from folks like that. And so we're out in the market, not just looking for what we think are going to be fantastic investments, that's certainly requisite, but um, we're out looking for products that we think are going to help solve problems that our LPs have uh, in running their businesses, not just uh, earning them an investment return. Uh, that's important, but it's not the only thing. So, so we really, you know, kind of have that value proposition that, that resonates with portfolio companies, of course, because we're helping them connect with potential customers. And those are our LPs who want to use those products. And then for our LPs, we, we act sort of as outsourced corporate development. Um, we're kind of the first screen out there um, looking at uh, various companies in the industry uh, that might be able to help them run their businesses better. Incredible. So when you're looking for an investment opportunity, what really stands out? What are you looking for? Yeah, so a lot of it is the same as any other venture fund firm. We're looking for a strong founding team that, that we can back that has experience, you know, whether it's founding companies uh, or, you know, specific domain expertise in the industry they're operating in, um, you know, in real estate tech, that often looks like somebody who came from the operating side. Maybe they're, they have their own, you know, small portfolio or um, they worked at an institutional real estate uh um, fund or, or company and understand the market, it means they're going to understand their customers well. So that domain expertise, that's important no matter what industry you're, you're investing in. Um, a large market opportunity, and I think in real estate, we clearly have that. Um, and that comes to, you know, it, it's super crucial for early stage venture because of the, the probabilities, right? Uh, most early stage companies you invest in at a seed or series A stage, unfortunately will fail. Uh, I think, you know, maybe half of them will succeed. Uh, and, and so when the odds are so low that a company succeeds, you need the winners to make up for the losers, right? You need the winners to be potentially billion dollar companies. And that's just kind of venture capital portfolio construction. And so we need to see that at least there's a possibility that a company can be absolutely massive because the probability is not in their favor. Um, so, so that's important. Um, and then also uh, unit economics, right? Strong unit economics. We need to believe a company can become profitable. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be making profit today, but we need to believe that there's a path to it so that someday they're attractive to an acquirer or to the public markets or, or what have you. Um, and I know, you know that's not always the case and companies are going public more often these days while they're still not profitable, but, um, but we like to at least see a path to get there. Fantastic. Now, is there anything in particular, any particular companies that REP has previously invested in that have taken off? Yeah, so we're, we're a relatively young fund. Um, so we've only been operating for a little over three years. And the typical venture um, relationship from investment to exit, right, to a liquidity event like an IPO or an acquisition is, I think, around seven years. Um, so most of our success uh, is, is on paper, right? We have companies that have raised rounds at higher valuations and we're, we're you know, proud of that success. Um, but, uh, but only one company so far that, that's actually exited. Um, that being said, on paper, the, the company I think that's, that, that we're maybe most proud of right now, um, where I think we're proud of all of our companies, but one exciting one uh, is called Smart Rent, and they're in the IoT space. Uh, so they basically came along and, uh, well, we and they and our LPs identified the issue that there's great smart home technology out there uh, from Google, from Amazon, from Vivint, from companies like that, that serve the single family market very well. As a homeowner, those are great products. Uh, you can set up kind of a smart home very well, but they don't solve the institutional market well at all because you have multiple stakeholders. You have not only the resident who wants to, you know, have a tech-enabled smart apartment or home, um, but you have the landlord as well or the owner uh, who wants to make sure that, you know, when a unit is vacant, the painter hasn't left the, the windows open or the AC is on. They want to make sure that they can uh, control and provision access, not just to the final door for a delivery person to get in, but uh, the the perimeter as well, and maybe the gym and, and that sort of thing to make sure that, you know, the dog walker is coming in, they're only getting a, a one-time code that lets them into the building for that, you know, five minutes that they need it, uh, as opposed to um, somebody having to share a key or something like that. 
Um, so, so there are a lot of kind of unique issues that they came along and solved really well. Um, and that's an example of, of, uh, of an area where we listened to our LPs and a pain point that they were seeing in the industry. And we said, okay, great. We're going to go out and find the best company, or if it doesn't exist, start it. Uh, luckily, Smart Run existed. Um, and, and invest in them and help coach them and uh, guide them to solve the problems that we're hearing from the industry. Uh, and so, you know, those are the types of investments we like to make where we're listening to industry pain points, we're listening to our LPs who, who are operators, uh, and then going out um, and investing on their behalf in something we know uh, they want to adopt. Uh, and that, you know, of course, then means that hopefully the investment is, is more successful. Incredible stuff. No, definitely. So in your opinion, what makes real estate tech a good investment for the future? I think there, there are a lot of things. Um, one being uh, it's a massive market, uh, but it's a market that is still, uh, even with the last kind of five years of rapid adoption, uh, technologically behind a lot of other uh, uh, industries. Um, and so uh, we have fantastic technology and innovation, whether it's in AI or um, you know, whatever else uh, in other industries that can absolutely benefit the real estate industry. Um, analyzing uh, property data to find mispricings in the market, um, bringing in things like AR and VR into virtual touring and the marketing process, um, whatever it is, technology that's been proven elsewhere, maybe it's in healthcare, uh, maybe it's in you know, uh, other kind of areas that have seen more tech adoption, um, bringing that into the real estate market, I think is applying technology that, that has low technology risk because it's been proven but high execution risk because you're bringing it into uh, a market that, um, that is not traditionally very good at adopting technology. Um, that I think is a huge opportunity. And if we can build companies that can execute on that technology and bring it in uh, in interesting ways, uh, I, I think you know, the, the industry is ready for, for adoption. And, and we see that in, in institutional and individual customers, right? Whether you're managing one unit uh, you're a traditional broker or you're, you know, an owner of 100,000 units or a manager of, of 600,000 units. Um, though all of those people are, I think, waking up and being ready to take some risks with technology. I think COVID has, has only accelerated that. So from what you're seeing, uh, are there any specific prop tech innovations that are looking quite prom promising at the moment? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we have kind of some, some internal theses around kind of where we're hunting uh, and what we think uh, over the next kind of five years or so uh, we should be looking at. And I, I can't share those entirely, um, but uh, I can certainly share, you know, a couple examples. Um, obviously, one is virtual touring. Uh, that, I mean, I, obviously, you guys are seeing a ton of success. Um, and I think that's an area where um, we've seen, it was kind of an inevitability a year ago, right? That, that this is where things were headed and companies were kind of slowly rolling it out and saying, yeah, you know, this is nice. Maybe it helps us lease or, or, or sell units um, a little bit faster. So we're going to slowly do it. And, you know, maybe it's a little too expensive, but we're going to get there. Then COVID hit and all of a sudden it was, we cannot do our jobs. We can't run our businesses without it. Um, and that's something that I think is here to stay. So that's an area that I think absolutely is extremely promising. Uh, you guys are riding that wave. Uh, we, we're, as an investment fund, obviously looking uh, at that area. Um, and so that's one thing I believe in. I think another area that, that kind of is starting to look like an inevitability is in what we call resident finance. So that includes things like deposit replacement and uh, lease guarantee, right? Um, in the U.S. at least, and I, I think more broadly, we're seeing legislation kind of come up that um, – is, is maybe making it so that uh, requiring a security deposit is not going to be legal or is not going to be recommended. And so we're seeing a lot of portfolios out there say, okay, what can we do that gives us some security that, you know, if somebody puts a hole in the wall, we have some recourse or we're covered, we have insurance, something like that. Um, but uh, we're not requiring a deposit. And they want to do that because it, uh, it lowers the friction for people to move into their properties. If somebody wants to move into their property, uh, but they say, well, we're going to need first month's rent and last month's rent and a security deposit. And all of a sudden, you know, we're needing you to pay thousands of dollars just to move in. Uh, they know that that creates friction and they know that that, you know, decreases their leasing velocity. And so they, they want to do away with it. So that's another thing that I think I see as, a, as an inevitability and a space where there are a lot of companies doing innovative things, also on like flexible rent payments, 
that don't necessarily have to hit on the first of the month. Um, that sort of resident finance category, I think, is, is going to see a ton of growth in the next few years. Now, you mentioned COVID. Um, now, in your opinion, obviously, this has changed the shape of the world and how we're all interacting with it. But do you think it's been a good move for PropTech or sort of a bad impact on it? Have you seen anything? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to say if it, it's a good move, right? Because it's provided a lot of challenges to uh, the real estate markets, to running, you know, running businesses effectively, and also to any startup, right? I mean, all of a sudden, working remote, um, reducing costs because the financing environment is uncertain. These are all headwinds, right? That make it difficult to run a business, to grow a business. Um, so, so it's hard to say it's been a good thing. I think it's definitely been a tailwind overall to prop tech adoption in multiple ways. Like, like I've been talking about virtual touring and other things. I think there were, there were certain things that, um, were maybe going to be adopted over the next 10 years that COVID hit and all of a sudden it was, wow, we need to find a way to do digital leasing, right? We need to find a way to have from initial tour, virtual touring all the way through to signing a lease. All of that needs to be digital. Uh, we need to be able to do that without in-person touch points. We can't rely on our leasing staff of professionals to come in and, and you know, seal the deal. Uh, we need to have a good UX for uh, residents to come in uh, and, and you know, feel good about moving into a property, right? The place that they're, they're going to live and spend a lot of time, uh, but fully just digitally. So things like that have, have left the industry saying, we need to adopt technology that maybe they wouldn't have gotten to for another several years. So I think we're seeing that as a tailwind for a lot of technology adoption. I, there are some things I think that that are seeing more headwinds than tailwinds. Um, you know that that um, you know maybe are seeing kind of Im immediate uh, tailwinds. Like okay, everybody needs um, san you know sanitization and uh, you know uh, air purification in their properties. If, is that going to be a permanent trend down the line? It, it might be, but not to the extent of something like virtual touring, where I think you know that that you know is going to be every unit in in you know several years. COVID impacted investment into prop tech as well. Um, I think it has a little bit, uh, but we were already seeing a trend from um, from kind of generalist. Uh, venture capital funds that don't necessarily focus on a specific sector. I think they were already recognizing this huge market opportunity and the fact that the, the industry is behind on technology adoption. So I think we were already seeing kind of a skyrocket uh, effect of, of dollars into prop tech. Uh, that, I think that certainly continued, um, but, but I think that was, that was kind of already happening before COVID, yeah. Now to turn our eyes to the future, where do you see the future of prop tech going? And how can venture capitals help facilitate that kind of movement and trajectory? Yeah, uh, I think one thing is, you know, as the industry moves from kind of, uh, kind of low technology operations, and I'm talking about mostly kind of your, your mom and pop independent segment, right? Moves from using Excel and, you know, maybe QuickBooks to maybe having a CRM that allows them to manage leads to you know, having a maintenance request ticketing system, some of this software that, that hasn't been adopted and, and now is starting to be. Um, and I'm talking about the rental market because that's you know, what we focus on. Um, but I think you know, there are parallels elsewhere. As we start to see that, the amount of data available for other companies or for, for other operators is skyrocketing, right? You're seeing all of these kind of uh, transactions and interactions that would have otherwise been in the dark, might have been over email, might have been um, you know, in Excel, all of a sudden are part of platforms that are collecting that data um, and uh, can potentially use it or um, leverage it to make other platforms even more valuable down the line. Um, so I think we're starting to see uh, that. And I think as venture capitalists investing in the sector, you know, we can be helpful in connecting some of these companies and saying, you know what, this company is, is seeing an end of the market that was previously in the dark uh, and has tremendous insights and access to that end of the market. Um, that can be really valuable to residents at a, you know, in a different part of the market or to a company that's focused on a completely different problem. And as venture capitalists, if we have these companies in our portfolio or we, we're seeing them as they raise money, uh, we can start to see kind of from the outside where some of these connections might be possible that might be a little bit difficult to see, you know, operating and trying to solve a specific problem. So I think that's one of the ways that as VCs in general, we can be valuable. Incredible. Now, in our audience today, we may have some future investors. Uh, do you have any advice in particular for them on how to sort of start or how they should look to investing? 
Yeah, I think it, it's a, it's kind of similar to, to my answer to the last question. I think um, you you need to find a way to be helpful to the companies you're investing in. Uh, you know, any um, founder out there. Uh, with a company and a product and a team that's worth investing in, they'll be able to go out and raise capital from anybody. But if they're smart, right, and, and of course, I'm, I'm a little bit biased because this is our, our model, right? But if they're smart, uh, they're going to raise capital from uh, funds that don't just benefit their balance sheet, but benefit their, the problems that they need to solve. So as an investor, I think it's always important to stay humble, right? And remember that it's the founders who are solving these problems, and they're solving many problems and, and growing a company is not easy, but if you can find a way to help solve some problem that they wouldn't otherwise solve. For us, a lot of times that's customers, right? It's finding the customers, the access to the customers that are in our LP group. Um, but, but for any VC, the focus should be, you know, going into a board meeting, um, how am I going to be able to be helpful? How can I help this company solve a problem that they're facing? Um, and I think you know, whether that's tapping your network to help them hire talent, right? They need a CTO. Okay, who do I know who, who could fit this job? Um, you know, helping them build their product. If you're a former founder and you've you know, built great products, you can come in and say, you know, here's something that we learned. You guys don't need to make that mistake because we already have. Um, so, so finding whatever it is that's your niche, your way that you can add value. And, you know, for me early in my career, that was simply uh, – I was an investment banker. I was an Excel monkey. Let me help you build your, your uh, Excel model. You know, uh, you, you're busy, you're building a company. Throw me your model. Let me give you some, some input. Let me structure it in a way that might be, you know, easier to keep track of over the coming months. Um, and, and, you know, I, that was how I could add value as somebody who had come out of, you know, investment banking programs. So that's what I did. Um, and as you kind of develop and as you're more senior in your career, maybe you find other ways that you can add value, but it's important to, to remember that you're there to help the companies uh, and, and solve problems that they have, uh, not there to kind of extract value and, and try and you know, make money off of them. Because if you're focused on that, you'll, you'll never get there, I don't think. Absolutely brilliant advice. I hope everyone watching is making notes. It's really good stuff. Uh, now, I do see our audience have asked a whole host of questions. Would it be all right for me to ask you some, Alec? Sure, absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, so our first question from our audience is, uh, how did you get into venture capital firm? Oh, no, sorry, not you. How does one, is the best way uh, to it. how does one get yeah, into venture capital firm? It's a good question. Uh, and, and unfortunately, there's no one answer. Um, if, it's, if it's an interesting career path, it, it is, you know, like I said, the, you know, the, the value and, and this is what venture capital funds look for when they're hiring, but the value is, you know, how you can be valuable to portfolio companies. So a lot of people find their way into venture, especially, you know, partners at kind of the senior level, uh, because they've founded companies before, because they've sat in that position and can therefore share that expertise. Um, uh, certainly some people like myself come from a financial background and it's, you know, that's kind of the value that, that uh, it, it, you know, these funds are looking for when they're hiring is there's a lot of investment diligence uh, both technical and kind of qualitative, uh, and you know, looking for somebody who can who can do that. But but venture capital is is a very much network driven industry, uh, and so uh, getting out there and and writing about technology that you're passionate about, um, talking to people who are in the industry or close to the industry, um, and and kind of trying to figure out right what is that niche, where where do I want to invest, where do I want to add value. Um, I think, you know, having those conversations uh, is, is a good way to eventually have somebody say, you know what, I, I talked to this person and they have some really interesting ideas around technology adoption. I think they have a good technical background. Um, they'd be a fantastic person to add to the team. Um, so it's not a, a very easy path. And there, there's a lot of people who've done a lot of writing about it. Uh, and there are certainly, um, you know, several different paths. So it's not easy to, to, to just say, you know, you, you go do this, then you talk to, you know, this company that recruits and then you so it, yeah it's not an easy answer but um but there are a lot of ways and i think if you just you know continue to have conversations and, and tap your network uh that's that's a lot of the way that, that most people find themselves into venture fantastic i know another one of our audience have asked is there a way to guarantee a good investment <laughs> i i wish uh i uh had an answer for that i think we're close uh, I, I certainly believe our model, you know, we have a way to kind of input uh, or, or impact rather uh, the outcomes of our portfolio companies um, by connecting them with 
uh, the companies uh, that have invested in our fund, right? Uh, so we can certainly say, okay, before we write a check, uh, we can introduce a company to our LPs, uh, and we can say, um, okay, we've heard from several of our LPs that they want to pilot this product, that they want to roll this product out broadly. That's a good indication that, you know, post-investment, not only our LPs, but the broader industry is going to want to adopt. So for us, uh, we can never guarantee a good investment, but we can get indications before we invest. Um, and I think the more value you can potentially add to a company, the more you can help them solve the problems they face, the more you get closer to being able to guarantee that. If it's, this company's not going to be successful unless they solve this problem, but, you know, I have the solution or my network has the solution, or if they hire this guy that I know, I think they can solve it, then you get closer to, right, not just passive investing of, you know, I think they can do it, but I think with the help of, of you know, the capital and, you know, whatever that, that you know, problem solving is, we can get closer to affecting a positive outcome. Uh, it's certainly never a guarantee, but, um, but you can have an impact and, and, and hopefully get closer to that. Excellent. Now, another member of our audience, sort of leading on from that, has asked, how do you define success at RET? Yeah, so it, it's, uh, you know, obviously financial success, like any venture fund, you know, we want to earn returns on our investments. But I think, you know, that is sort of secondary for us to are we helping our investors solve problems in their businesses? Are we helping them innovate their tech stacks? Are we helping them uh, operate more profitably? And are we helping them deliver a better uh, experience to their residents, uh, you know, to their rental residents. And that, that is, I think, how we define success. And if we aren't doing that, I don't think we're making money anyway. Um, so for us, it's, it's about that. Um, it's, it's about helping our investors innovate in the industry and innovate in their businesses. And of course, in doing so, helping our portfolio companies achieve their goals and, and become valuable companies. Uh, and that's how then we make our money. Excellent. Now, someone has also asked on the flip side of all this, what happens if an investment goes bad? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. Um, and, and luckily it's one that we haven't had to uh, focus on too much, but, uh, but it does happen. Um, it happens in venture capital uh, more often than, than I think there are successes. Uh, and you know, there, there are various uh, things that you, you do in a situation where it becomes clear that you know, a, a product is not um, resonating and that you know, maybe you're not hitting that path to positive unit economics that you thought, and the company's gonna keep losing money, uh, number one, uh, you look out for the company's customers, right? You don't leave them high and dry. So you make sure, it, well, and the company's employees, right? So you make sure, okay, we're not gonna let this come up and surprise everyone. It's not, oh, hey, sorry, we're not making payroll this week, we're shutting down. You're gonna leave your customers totally burned, and you're gonna leave your employees totally burned. So that is, you know, priority number one is to, to take care of those stakeholders. Um, and in most cases, you can do that unless it's, you know, we're running out of runway and raising a round and then that round falls through last minute. I think that's where you see trouble there. Um, but if, if normally you have visibility, you, you get to the point where it's okay, you know, this isn't working for whatever reason, you know, we thought we could charge this price in it and we can't, or we thought that we could get these costs down to this and we can't. Uh, and you get to the point where you, you say, okay, is there something salvageable here in terms of technology that we can pivot into a new company that we can leverage, maybe that we can sell to a strategic acquirer who might be interested in it for their business, um, or is it time to just sunset this and, and then you, you take care of the people involved? But that's, that's part of the game and that's, that's part of venture investing. And unfortunately, it does happen. You just want to make sure that you're, you're not, um, not really screwing anybody over when it does happen. Excellent. Cool. No, that's really sort of insightful advice, because I think it is hard. If something does go wrong, you need to know, is it salvageable? What can you do to sort of make the best out of Absolutely. what happened? And, and I'll say that, you know, it's not just right, the CEO on an island. That's a very hard uh, conclusion to make, right? This, to the end, the CEO will and the founders you know, will have conviction in their product. Um, but that is why I think it's important as a founder to build a, a board full of people who you trust, who have it, who can share advice, who've maybe been in that position before, whether they've founded successful or unsuccessful companies or both, uh, so that, you know, you have advisors uh, who can say, you know what, this might be a blind spot of yours, but actually this is a big risk and, and maybe it's time to start thinking about course correcting or, or shutting things down. I think that's if, if as a founder, you don't have those people you can rely on, it's very difficult to, to, um, to kind of get to that point and understand, you know, when you need to course correct. Mm. 
Definitely. Now, I've had another uh, audience member ask, is investing in a company the same as investing in the stock market? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I, I think there are similarities, right? Again, you need to kind of develop a thesis and, and have uh, conviction behind that thesis and think that, you know, making that bet is going to, you know, pan out. But where it differs, again, is the, the active role that as a, a venture capital investor, uh, you have in the growth of a business. And not every fund is like this. Some funds um, just simply invest in too many companies. They're not going to take board seats. They're not going to lead investment. But for you know, most venture capital investors, where it starts to become different from investing in the stock market, uh, in addition to being a, a far riskier asset class, right? You know, 50% of, of companies in the S&P 500 don't go to zero. Um, so, so it's different in terms of risk profile. But I think the major difference has been that involvement post-investment and, and helping companies grow and, and being a part of that growth story uh, as opposed to um, kind of, you know, waiting and seeing and, and, and hoping that your, your, uh, your investment thesis uh, kind of pans out. Mm. Fantastic. Now, our last question for today is where do you see a real gap in the real estate market at the moment? Yeah, uh, I think we've covered a, a, a fair number of, of things I would list here. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll recap a little bit. Um, you know, again, right to iSpy, uh, virtual touring is a big one. Um, you know, I mentioned kind of the resident finance space as well. Uh, I think, you know, to a large extent, IoT still is. Uh, we invest in smart rent and now, at least in the U.S., they are uh, the industry leader in terms of smart apartments in the country uh, with, you know, over 100,000 apartments that they have, you know, in, you know, installed smart technology into, but that's, you know, over 100,000 versus just in the U.S., we have 47, 48 million apartment units. That's not, you know, mentioning single family homes, of which there are, you know, many more. Um, so that's something that I think is still a major gap, uh, and it, it has shifted from a nice to have uh, amenity of, you know, hey, this really differentiates something to, you know, people are starting to expect it. Uh, they want a smart door lock. They want a thermostat they can control remotely, stuff like that. And I think that'll continue. And I think it's a gap that we still need to work to bridge. Uh, and I think Smart Run is in a good position to do that. Um, I think one gap that we, we haven't talked about um, is just in some of these legacy products uh, that are due for innovation, whether it's um, core property management and accounting uh, that hasn't been innovated on in, in you know, maybe a decade or more. Um, and, and has the potential to, or something like revenue management and yield management. And that extends to vacation rental, short-term rental, right? Um, extends to um, the, the institutional long-term rental market as well. Uh, I think there's a gap uh, in, in that pricing and in the way that we're pricing uh, apartments. And I think the way that, uh, you know, people are, are applying new methods, new statistical methods, uh, to analyzing these markets, they're identifying that, you know, they're mispricing in the market. And maybe that's an, an, an opportunity for buying properties or selling properties in a portfolio. Maybe that's an opportunity for changing rent as a rental portfolio. Um, but that's something that I think as we start to see more data and as we see more advanced statistical models uh, is a huge gap that, that we can help bridge. Incredible. Well, Alec, thank you so much for joining me for today's session. It's been really informative. I know I've definitely learned a lot because I knew very little about venture capital going in. So maybe I'll be an investor soon. <laughs> yeah, great. Hey, we'd, we'd, love, to, we'd love to have you join. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it was great, great uh, coming on. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure anytime. And for everyone watching, cool. thank you so much for coming back to our future Friday session. Uh, we will be back again on Tuesday for Tips Tuesday. So we'll see you then, same time, and you can use the same Zoom link. Now, until then, do please stay safe and stay healthy out there. Have a wonderful weekend. And as always, keep it 360. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.